You probably didn't get into fly fishing because you wanted to throw a bobber for hours on end. If I had to guess, I bet most of us got into fly fishing because we love the idea of throwing dry flies to rising fish. And there is not a better time to do that than during a hatch. There's just one problem with that. Some hatches are notoriously tough to fish. And one hatch in particular can be extremely frustrating. The bugs are small. The water's usually really low and clear. It's windy. The fish are picky. And then you need flies with all these weird names like sparkle duns and cripples. And to top it all off, anglers are all over this hatch like, well, fish on flies. On today's episode of Untangled, I'm going to walk you through how to fish this particularly difficult hatch, and you are going to leave with all the tools that you need for an incredible day out on the water. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone, presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. Excited to be here behind the microphone once more back in my glorious home of Wyoming instead of, you know, somewhere else. I, I miss it. I, I, I love to travel, but I really miss it sometimes when I don't get to spend enough time here at home. I, I love Wyoming. It's great. It's so isolated. It's quiet. I mean, nobody can find me here. Uh, you know, I still haven't been extradited to the Island of Spice for that incident all those years ago. And speaking of the Island of Spice and that incident, I can't go into details on that particular uh, little little uh, shindig that happened. However, the information that I'm going to share in today's podcast is pretty, pretty similar to the stuff that got me in trouble all those years ago. So this is stuff that I would I would pay attention to. All right. Quit scrolling on your phone. Right, get out a notepad. You're gonna want to take some notes for this one because this is some serious good stuff here. I mean, the, the info I'm gonna to dump today could get me banned in like six European countries and all of Saskatchewan. But I'm gonna soldier on with it anyway because you know what? Y'all are worth it. You're the best viewers and listeners in the fly fishing world. And dad gum it, I'm gonna come through for y'all. Speaking of, we're gonna talk about fishing hatches today. We're gonna to talk about a specific hatch in particular, and that is the blue-winged olive hatch. It might be my favorite hatch, and for those who don't know, the blue-winged olive is a species of mayfly, and they hatch uh, late spring into early summer. Uh, sometimes you'll get them into early summer. They'll, they'll peter off a little bit, and then they hatch again in the fall. They're usually the first good hatch of the year and the last good hatch of the year that aren't like your really tiny trichos or your midges, or whatnot. So they're a lot of fun. I love fishing them. They're a very challenging hatch. Like I mentioned in the hook to the show, they can be really tough. The fish get really picky because in the spring and in the fall, the water is usually low. It's usually very clear. The fish are very discerning about what they take, and there are so many different life cycle stages of a mayfly for the fish to chew from, and they end up keying in on specific specific lifestyles life cycle stages that if you throw the wrong one, you, you might end up getting refused. So there's a lot that goes into successfully fishing a mayfly hatch. And if you can master the blue wing hatch, you're going to be fine no matter what else you're doing. So that's why I really wanted to walk us through that today. But I would like to tell a story before we start getting into the nitty gritty of it, because this story is going to illustrate a couple of points that I think are worth remembering. So set the stage for you. It's a couple weeks ago. Alex and I were in Montana. We're on the Beaverhead River and we were fishing a few days before we went and did the podcast with the folks at the RL Winston Rodco. That was our last podcast, I believe episode 70. So if you haven't watched that, definitely go watch that when you're done here. It's all about fly rods, fly rod action design. Really, really fun show. Folks at Winston were great to do that with us. But anyways, Alex and I were out on the Beaverhead River. We're having a good time because it dumped like almost a foot of snow that morning. And we woke up and we're like, oh, I thought we were fishing today. I guess we're working. But then the sun came out and the wind died down a little bit. So we got out, we left the hotel, we went to the river and we get to the river and 
things got really exciting right off the bat because I saw a fish rise within like two minutes of being there. So I was like, ooh. And I hadn't tied anything on yet. I was just watching the river. Alex had already gone down. I think he tied something on. I think he was nymphing a little down river up me. And I see this fish continuing to rise. So I hollered at Alex. I was like, hey, hey, I found a riser. And he didn't believe me. And then he saw it rise. <laughs> so he comes up and we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on. And we started to see the blue winged olives on top of the water. And it's just that classic, wonderful sight. You see them. They're sitting there on the water. They've got their really tall wings. They look like a sailboat going down. And we just got excited. I mean, it's mayflies in Montana. Does it get any more classic fly fishing than that? It, it was just, it was like it was meant to be. We were psyched. So we tie on a bunch of different mayfly patterns. and. We get to fish, and Alex found this one. He could see it rising, and he stocked up on it. He got into the perfect position, and I think he had like a size 16 parachute on, and he threw a few casts, and he actually put that fish down within two or three casts, which we we're both really surprised by because, yes, the fish can be picky during this hatch, but to put a fish down that quickly, that was that was kind of surprising. And in hindsight, that should have been our first clue that we were doing something wrong. But we were both so excited at seeing mayflies that we just dived into this thing head first and we just ignored everything else. I threw some threw some bugs and I got refused a couple of times. And then I had some short strikes coming up. And a short strike, it's when the fish comes up. And they either strike at it and decide at the last minute that they don't want it in turn, or they just come up, realize eh, that's not what I wanted, and then they shoot back down and it looks like they rose to your fly. You'd call that a short strike if you want as well. But we just kept getting refused and refused and refused. Meanwhile, there are just piles of blue wings floating down the river and trout are rising everywhere. And me and Alex were just stumped. We could not figure out why the fish were not cooperating with us. We thought we had the right bugs. We thought we were getting a good presentation. And you know, in the end, it turns out we weren't. And I'll share the end of that in a minute. But what I want to point out here so far in our little story, there's two things that really stand out to me, all right? The first is that fly selection and presentation is supremely important. And I will get into this more in a minute. But when you're fishing any hatch, this is what matters most, right? You need a good fly that is a reasonable imitation of what's on the water, and you need to present that fly well in a way that looks natural. If you don't have both of those, you are going to struggle to put fish in the net during a hatch, right? This is also a good reminder of the importance of using the right size tippet in these situations. Uh, and just the right kind of tippet, period. Nylon is going to be your best friend since it doesn't sink. And usually during a mayfly hatch like this, I will downsize and start with 5X. I usually like to fish 4X all the time. But when the bugs get a little small and the fish get picky, I start off with 5. I'll go down to 6 if I need to. I really don't like to go below 6 if I don't have to because you usually end up having to play the fish longer to not break the tippet. And I'd rather get the fish in quickly, get it back into the water, than play it for too long and maybe risk overworking it uh, to exhaustion. So that's the first thing we learned from this. Presentation and fly selection are important. Okay, Alex and I, we both had the right presentation. And we thought, we were convinced because we saw those blue wings on the water that we had the right fly selection. But it turns out we didn't have the right fly selection because... The second thing that we learned from this story is that sometimes, and this is what makes blue wing hatches in particular, this is what makes them so tough because blue wings often overlap with midge hatches. Midges are a real tiny, tiny little fly. We often say that like any small fly is a midge, and that's not really true because midges are an actual specific species of fly. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of midges, but they're very small. They have a different shaped body different style of wings from a mayfly or even a caddis, right? They, they all, uh, you know, they, they really do look just kind of like a, uh, a little mosquito at times when you see them just walking around. So that's kind of their, their shape. So they look a little bit different and midges 
like I said, will often hatch when the blue wings are hatching. And that can cause a lot of confusion, not just for newer anglers, but also for anglers who like to think they know what they're doing because Alex and I didn't realize that during that blue wing hatch, there were a bunch of midges coming off either, or, or, or as well, pardon me. There were tons of midges coming off. So we should have, if we'd been as observant as we should have been, we would have seen all those midges coming off and we would have actually been like, huh, they're refusing our blue wings. Maybe we should tie a midge on. Neither one of us did, right? We didn't realize until too late that they were eating midges. Even with all those blue wings on the water, for whatever reason, the fish didn't want them. They just wanted the midges. What, what actually ended up telling us that they wanted to eat midges is Alex got fed up with getting refused on the dry fly. So he tied a nymph rig on and he caught like three fish on a zebra midge. And then he comes over to me. He's like, you know, I think they're eating midges. I said, oh yeah, why is that? He's like, well, I, I just caught three fish on a zebra midge. So, and that's when I look, I look back down at the water and I could see all the midges mixed in with the blue wings. And I realized, you know what? I bet they were eating midges this whole time. And that's why they refuse my blue wings. Now, Alex tried to use this moment to prove the superiority of nymph rigs, but then I reminded him that anybody can catch fish on nymphs and that real anglers catch fish on dries or not at all, right? So we settled that once and for all is what we did. <laughs> now, I wanted to keep those two lessons in mind because I think those are going to make the biggest difference for you as you go out. I mean, it's, I'm recording this here. It's April, and this is prime time. Blue wing hatches are really starting to kick into gear right now. So as you go out to fish your blue wing hatches or any other mayfly hatch, I want you to keep these things in mind, those two lessons in mind, because I think they will really help you have the correct mindset when you go to try and have some success on these days, all right? The blue wings can be just so finicky. But I love to fish this hatch, even though they can be so tough, because it, it is challenging, right? Good caddis or yellow sally or stonefly hatches, they're usually a lot simpler to fish. I won't say that they're easy, but they are a lot simpler. You don't have as many different options to fish. Uh, caddis, sometimes you do, but certainly like stoneflies and whatnot, uh, yellow sallies, it, it's pretty straightforward what the fish want. And you just got to get the fly in front of them. All right. That's a lot simpler proposition than during a blue wing hatch. Now, I love, I love the fact that it's tough, that these mayfly hatches can be really tough. I love the feeling of working to fool a trout when a trout is at its most selective. And for me, that has almost always been during a blue wing hatch. They'll be selective during midge hatches and trichos as well. And, and trichos, for those who don't know, those are just really tiny, tiny mayflies. They'll be very selective during a trico hatch too, but for me, the, the pinnacle of dry fly fishing for me has always been getting the fish to cooperate during a blue wing hatch. Now, I do have a few other tips that I want to dive into about blue wing hatches as well. I think these are the tips that will really help you master this hatch and just knock it out of the park, right? First one, you need to make sure that you are getting really good drifts that do not line the trout. Now, what I mean by lining the trout is if a fish is rising and it's actively feeding and then you cast and you land all of your fly line or you land a whole bunch of the thick part of your leader over the top of that fish, chances are that surface disturbance is going to spook that fish and it's going to quit feeding for a minute. Now, it's not going to put that fish down permanently, not all the time, sometimes the fish will go down for just a couple of minutes. Sometimes they won't really care, but especially during these blue-winged olive hatches, you've got to make sure you're not lining trout because, again, the water is usually very low and clear this time of year, so the fish are very, very aware that when they're feeding on dry flies, they're exposing themselves to uh, all sorts of different predators. So the better your presentation can be, the better chance you have of catching that fish. And part of that is not lining the trout. So set your casts up in a way that you are landing the fly and just a minimal amount of tippet in front of the fish. And that will reduce the chances of lining it and scaring it away. 
So that's your first tip. Now, your second tip, and this is something that it just takes a ton of time to, to really master and understand, but you've got to identify what hatch stage they're eating. Are they eating the emergers? Are they eating the adults? Or are they eating the spinners slash spent wings? Now, we have a whole bunch of resources on uh, emergers, adults, spent wings, how to pick the right fly. I'll link some of those in the podcast description. If you're not completely familiar with those, you can go check those resources out that we've got. But the way that you can tell, just uh, as a quick recap, if you see a really splashy rise or a subtle rise where you see only the dorsal and tail fin of a fish, it's eating bugs that are stuck in the surface film of the water. That's what that more subtle rise where you only see the their dorsal fin and their tail fin break the surface. Or if you see that really splashy rise, it can also mean that as that bug is emerging up off the riverbed and it's shooting up through the water and it's ready to be an adult and be a big boy, that the fish are chasing it down and they kind of jump out of the water to, to grab it and whatnot. So that can be a good indication that they're eating emergers. Now, if you have a rise with air bubbles in them or where you see a trout's nose break the surface, that means that it is eating either the adult or the spent wings, right? The best way to tell for certain is to pick out a bug or two and watch them as they drift down the water. If the fish are eating the adults, it's easy to see because they'll come munch them. If the adults don't disappear when a trout rises, it is safe to bet that they are eating either an emerger or a spent wing. All right. And that's, that's part of the mayfly life cycle a little bit. You, to understand what I mean here, you've got to understand the mayfly life cycle just a bit. They start out as larvae underneath the water, then they emerge, right? They become that emerger and they emerge into the subadult, uh, where they then are are hanging out on the water surface for a minute. They dry their wings off, and then they fly away to trees or nearby vegetation, and that's where they become the dun. They become the full adult, and then they fly back from those trees after a little bit, and they mate, lay their eggs, and die, and that's when they become the spinner. So that's your brief overview of the mayfly life cycle. Yeah. Uh, tip number three, I believe is where we are at now, uh, to help make sure you've got some success during a blue wing hatch, please pay attention to the size of bug that they're eating. Cause trout can get very picky about the size of a fly during a hatch. I've found that it's best to try and match that size exactly. And the best way to do that is to grab a bug off the top of the water or try to snag one. Uh, on your hat or out of the air. I've also found that if you just sit on the bank for a few minutes, just, you know, chill, grab your Diet Coke, maybe take some wings out of your waders because, I mean, who doesn't store wings in their waders for a streamside snack? I mean, come on. What are you guys, animals? You know, you're, you're sitting there. Uh, you're likely to get a few bugs crawling on you if there is a good hatch, and then you can you match those bugs to one that's in your box of the same size. Now, I should say there are instances where an exact match for size just might not get it done. If there's a ton of naturals on the water, you're going to need yours to stand out a little bit more. And in that case, you can go a little bit bigger just to get the trout's attention. And sometimes that'll work. But generally, you really want to make sure you're matching that size as close as you possibly can. Now, tip number four is make sure you know what they're eating. I talked about this earlier but it bears repeating again because the reason Alex and I got uh, our butts handed to us during that hatch on the beaver head is we were convinced because we saw the blue wings on the water that the fish were eating blue wings. We didn't stop to think that, hey, maybe they're eating the midges, and we didn't even stop to really look at what bugs the fish were eating. We just tied bugs on. We saw a blue wing, tied bugs on, started fishing. Sometimes that works, but sometimes you get your butt kicked because you didn't pay enough attention. So you really got to spend some time, watch what the fish are eating, watch what they're rising on. And if you don't see them eating those adult blue wings off the surface and they refuse any of your blue wing patterns that you throw at them, they refuse your emergers, then tie on a midge pattern. Uh, I really like to, in those instances, I really like to throw like a B BWO cripple or some kind of a dun and then I follow it with a Griffiths gnat. 
because uh, that just kind of covers both of my bases, and then it helps me see that smaller griffin snap better as well. Now, your last tip to make sure that you can nail these blue wing hatches, uh, I'm going to tell you some of my favorite flies for fishing blue wing hatches. But before I get into the actual patterns, I want to make a plug for a pattern that I think is underutilized by a lot of anglers because they just don't realize that it's necessary to have, and that would be the crippled blue wing dollop. A cripple is an adult version of a blue wing that has some sort of deformity that, get, that causes it to get stuck in the surface film or right on the surface of the water. And sometimes when the rise forms look like the trout are eating adults, they're actually eating those crippled bugs. So if you see fish rising to adults, then I would suggest tying on a parachute blue, blue winged olive first as your first fly, and then put about 18 to 24 inches of tippet off of that and tie a cripple behind it. I almost always like to fish two dry flies during a hatch to cover my bases, especially during a blue wing hatch, but you certainly don't have to do that. All right, now we've got that plug out of the way. I do want to make sure I give you guys the patterns that I would recommend, and those are make sure you've got that parachute blue winged olive. I cannot overstate. That is my favorite blue wing adult pattern. It's wonderful. It, it just floats well. It's easy to see. It, it just works. You need a sparkle dun. I mentioned this fly earlier, and I love sparkle duns. They imitate a mergers. They can also imitate a cripple. They're just a great fly. I've got Sparkle Dunn's galore in my box. I absolutely love them. A Last Chance Cripple, that's a great cripple pattern. And those are traditionally tied a little bit bigger, but you can easily tie those down into like a 16 or a 14 if you need to. Uh, bars and mergers are great to have. You can drop that behind a Dunn and just really do some work. Any quill body to merger patterns will work. The quills I've found make those emergers look really lifelike. And then a Griffiths gnat is a must-have because sometimes you can get away fishing a blue wing hatch with a Griffiths gnat if they're just eating small stuff. And then it's just always good to have that little bug kicking around. Now, I would focus on making sure that you've got these bugs in flies that are in like that 14 to 20 size range. You don't really need much beyond those sizes. And I would focus on a few different shades of olive bodies. I've found that a lot of the early season blue winged olives are very dark. So even Adams colored bugs work really well for me. Uh, and this also aligns with our right fly formula, which I mentioned earlier. So we talk all about matching size and shape and then color in the right fly formula. And we have a video on this topic as well. So if you need more help with understanding how to match flies that you find on the water to the ones that are in your box, you can watch it. I've linked that in the podcast description. And whew, was that enough information, folks? That was a lot. I know I threw a lot at you, but I really appreciate you sticking with it. And I was right at the end of the day, wasn't I? I bet your notepad is just filled to the brim. I bet, I bet this is a show you're going to have to rewatch about 12 times. No, <laughs> I hope you don't have to rewatch it 12 times. I wouldn't want to hear myself talk that much. But, oh, anyways, well, I appreciate you all sticking around. For that, and don't fear because we do have the Q and A section of the show coming on up. So get comfortable, put the notepads aside, and just get ready to hear some great questions from listeners of the show. Before we get into the Q and A part of the show this week, I just want to let any new listeners to the show know that every week. We do a Q&A section on the show where I answer questions from listeners to Untangled. You can submit questions to us via the link in the podcast description. You can email them to us. You can send the questions to us via Carrier Pigeon. Those routes are open again. There was a closure last week, but the uh, Department of Pigeons, that's the DOP, uh, did get that reopened for us in enough time. So it was great to hear that the Carrier Pigeon Network has been restored. Smoke signals are acceptable as well, and of course, the Pony Express never sleeps. You can get questions to us that way as well. So any, any way that you want to submit a question, you can, and I do want to hear from y'all. Questions are what fuel this show. The main part of the show, the first part of the show, I always write that uh, based on questions that we've received. I'm not just coming up with random stuff. It's all based on questions that we get from y'all. So we need the questions. Please keep them coming in. I love reading them. I love going through them. I love hearing 
what our wonderful listeners and viewers have to say and have to ask. So now that we got that out of the way, uh, our first question this week is from Michael from Pennsylvania. He writes in and says, Dear Spencer, greetings from a fellow high school English teacher, though it sounds like you're off to bigger and better things with VFC. I've spent the last few months catching up on every episode of Untangled, and while the wealth of fly fishing knowledge has helped me a ton, the absence of root beer from the great soda debate has been painful at times. Kidding aside, thank you for all you do to educate and assist novice fly anglers like myself. Your tips have helped me put many more trout in the net and have more good days on the water. My question for you is pretty specific and related to a particular afternoon I had on the water. For context, my favorite rod to fish is a 6 foot 9 inch fiberglass 3 weight, usually for mountain stream native brookies. It's great for confined spaces and smaller fish, and I've fallen in love with the slower action. On this particular day, though, I was using that rod to fish for browns on my local small spring creek. I was lucky enough to find a hole with midges and blue-winged olives on the water and many rising fish. I tied on a double-dry blue-winged olive midge rig and within an hour had three fish in the net. I was stoked. Unfortunately, I lost more fish than I netted, and one of the fish I netted was foul-hooked. My question is this. Would the added backbone of a four- or five-weight graphite rod assist with setting the hook and keeping tension to the fish, or is this more likely a me problem? I have been doing better with keeping tension to the fish once the hook has been set, but I can sometimes set the hook a bit softly, especially if I am not actively anticipating a strike. Sorry for the length. Any advice you can give would be greatly appreciated. Tight lines. Michael, wonderful question. First off, thank you. And don't ever worry about the length of your question, right? The more details that we can get, the better. And I hope you're enjoying high school English over there in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you teach freshmen like I do, uh, have you done Romeo and Juliet yet? Or are you just starting it? Because I usually save it for the spring. The kids love Romeo and Juliet in the spring. They they don't, actually. I don't think they love Romeo and Juliet ever. <laughs> but anyways, I'm sorry Root Beer hasn't made the great soda debate here on the show either. Uh, I don't have anything against Root Beer. I just, I need something with caffeine in it. And I, I'm not aware of too many different root beers with caffeine, although I'm probably wrong there because I, I don't know a whole bunch about root beer. But anyways, let, let's get to your question here. What you describe, Michael, is something that I've experienced myself, and I think it's fairly common. I spent some time looking around on fiberglass fly rod forums, and it seems that other anglers who have switched to fiberglass, especially from graphite fly rods, have had a similar issue. They set the hook only to have the fish shake free after a few seconds. In that instance, what you're dealing with is the difference in how stiff a graphite rod is compared to how stiff a fiberglass rod is. Glass rods are built to flex through most of their entire length, which makes them less rigid in the sections that traditionally are used for generating lifting power. The butt section of a rod has a reserve power for fighting and lifting fish to the net, while the tip and maybe the, the little bit of that, that section below the tip as well. Uh, they flex to help load the rod, but they stay light enough to protect tippets from snapping. Fiberglass is pretty flexible throughout the entire length of the rod, so you have a lot less of that backbone, and that's just a term that we use to describe how stiff a rod feels. With a graphite rod, less of the rod is moving when you set the hook, so you have more static material that can help drive the hook into a trout's mouth. With a fiberglass rod, you don't have as much static material because it's moving, right? It's bending, it's flexing. So you do need to set the hook a little bit harder. In the words of my buddy Dom Swintoski, set the hook and set it hard. You're <laughs> never going to regret too hard of a hook set. Uh, you, you'll even see this on bamboo fly rods from time to time. I, I build bamboo fly rods, and when I pull those out to fish with instead of one of the graphite ones, I do run into that issue where I, I start setting and I'm not setting hard enough. I'm setting way too softly. So it's something that happens, and it's just something that you've got to learn to compensate for uh, at some point. So in short, like I said, you're used to light hook sets. Um, just make sure you put a little bit more effort into them, and you should be good to go. That was a wonderful question, Michael. Thank you so much for sending that in. Next question 
A buddy and I were fishing below Yosemite for rainbows, and the weather was constantly changing between heavy rain and hail. Every so often, the sun would come out, and mayflies would start to fly, and the trout would rise. But as the sun disappeared, the trout went back down, and bugs disappeared. My question is, how do you choose the right fly in that situation? Thanks, guys. And that comes to us from Fisher from California. Well, Fisher, this is a great question, and that's a great name. Uh, it's kind of like you were destined to do this thing or something like that. It's crazy. Well, as to your question, the weather certainly can impact bug hatches, but usually it happens in the opposite way that you describe. Usually when the clouds move in, the bugs will start to hatch, but sometimes a hard rain can put that hatch down too. So it's not unusual to experience it the way that you've described. But in this situation, what I would do if I were you is I would fish a dry dropper rig. The fish, even when they're not rising on the bugs, they are likely eating the nymphs as those nymphs are moving up in the water column to become emergers. Even when it is raining or hailing on the water, they're probably still eating those nymphs. The nymphs just might be moving up more slowly or not moving at all in the heavy rain, uh, kind of waiting for a break when they can emerge up onto the water surface, dry their wings, and fly away to do their mayfly things that they do. They like to keep that stuff hush-hush so we really don't know what goes on after they leave the river and head to the sea I may. So I can't help you out on that part, but I can help you out with the before part. So in this instance, your dry fly could be the adult version of a mayfly like a parachute atoms, a uh, blue winged olive PMD or whatever flavor mayfly is hatching and then drop a nymph version of that mayfly below it to catch fish uh, in between when they're actually rising. And just as a point of clarification, the parachute atoms is not a specific mayfly. It's got the tapered body and the longer tail that mayflies have. So it works extremely well during mayfly hatches, but the parachute atoms is really just kind of an attractor pattern. It kind of looks like everything and nothing all at the same time. But those do work very well during mayfly hatches, so you want to have those on hand. Hopefully that helps. Thank you so much for sending that question on in. Our next question is actually twofer because I've got two questions that were pretty closely related, so I want to read them both and answer them here at the same time. So our first one, is Paul from New Jersey writes in and says, hello, Spencer, glad to hear you're trying to cut down on the Diet Coke. Tasty as it is, it is no good for health. You can retrain your brain to like a healthier replacement. I did. The tippet rings really help extend the life of a leader. Is there any way to straighten kinks and bends from the leader to extend the life even further? Thank you for considering this question. Keep up the great work on the shows. And then Nick from California wrote in and said, how much of the original leader can you cut off before you should put on a new leader onto the fly line? So these are both really good and they run together. That's why I wanted to answer them together. I'm going to go with Paul's first though, because it will dovetail nicely into Nick's. So Paul, you are like the third person uh, at least that has written in lately just about tippet rings. I really appreciate hearing about them from other anglers. I don't really use them because I just don't find them as convenient as some other anglers do. But I definitely think folks should try them out and see if they like them before they make a decision on them. Don't just take what I say, all right? I, I fish very differently than a lot of other folks do in some key ways. So a lot of you might end up loving tippet rings, and that's great. Definitely give them a shot. And for those who don't know, a tippet ring, just a, it's a small little metal ring that you tie to the end of your tippet. And then from that, you can tie on long lengths of tippet to help keep your leader in great shape, uh, but still extend your leader when you need to nymph really deep pools. I would shy away from using tippet rings on a dry fly rig because they will sink. Uh, but as far as straightening kinks and bends in your leader, when I pull my line off of my reel and I start rigging up for the day, I pinch the leader between my thumb and my forefinger and I pull it tight until it just about starts to burn my fingers. Uh, adding this heat will help straighten the leader. And I do that maybe twice over really kinked up sections and it straightens up quite nicely. Uh, we also have a masterclass video on rigging up where we show exactly what this looks like. I've linked that in the podcast description for you to take a look at. Now, Nick's question was about how far up the leader you can cut before you need to just trash your leader and tie on a new one. Well, 
Nick, that really depends on how far up the leader you end up cutting off to tie on new rigs. Let's say that you've got a nine foot four X leader. That's what I use all the time. And you're fishing dry flies and you need to tie on some five X leader for that. Cause the flies are small. Perfect. You do that. No, no big deal. Well, then the next day, you don't need that 5X tippet anymore. So you cut it off at the knot. You tie on some new flies to the end of that original leader. And let's say that situation repeats itself for a while until you've cut off maybe 18 inches between tying on new knots and and whatnot and tying on new flies. You've cut off 18 inches of that original 9-foot 4X leader. At this point, you probably want to tie in another section of 4X tippet because you're likely into a thicker section of your leader at that point that's probably similar in diameter to 3X tippet. You can honestly fish with the same leader for a long time, depending on how much you cut away when you're doing new rigs or replacing flies. The only time that I ever really change a leader myself is if I can feel abrasions on it because of those weak points where they could snap, and you don't want that to happen. Uh, trust me, you don't want that leader to snap when you've got a really nice fish on the, on the line. And then you think, man, I should have replaced that leader because I felt it got banged up on those rocks. Anyways, uh, I'll replace it if I can feel abrasions or if it gets knots in it that are just too tight to undo, I'll just, if I can, I'll try and cut it and rebuild it. But usually I'll just tie a whole new leader on. Uh, Otherwise, I just keep fishing those leaders. I attach more tippet with a blood knot. That's what I always use. Uh, it's, It's really strong. It's low profile. I don't have issues with my blood knots coming undone. I, I just like them. So that, that's the one that I would go with. So thank you both, Nick and Paul, for those wonderful questions. Next question comes to us. Uh, Chris from New Jersey writes in and says, Hey there, I recently listened to your Five Ways to Break Through podcast, and I wanted to make a quick comment. Ugly cast catch fish, too. Over the years, I've learned to let those awful casts float, and I've caught some of my best fish. Just a thought. My question, I've been a beginner intermediate fisherman for almost 10 years. I don't fish enough to really break out of that area, but also believe that's as much as I'll ever, as I'll need for the fishing I do. I catch fish, I tie flies, I enjoy it. However, when I'm on the water, I can't shake my imposter syndrome. A feeling that I'll always be an inadequate fly fisher. Is this something all fly fishers struggle with? I love the podcast. It's the only fishing one that's both useful and entertaining. Please keep up. The awesome work. Well, Chris, thank you so much for the question. And uh, you are 100% correct. I used to tell back in my guiding days, I'd tell my clients all the time to let it float, let that cast float. Because if it wasn't perfect, they'd always want to pick up and recast. And I have to tell them, no, let it float, let it go. Uh, Because often, even though it wasn't perfect, it was good enough. And people would catch fish on those drifts. And, And that's part of the beauty of fly fishing. A lot of the times, good enough is just enough to make the magic happen. As to your question, Chris, I really appreciate that you are willing to be vulnerable. A writer friend of mine, good buddy, told me not long ago that vulnerability is what makes really good writing, and I think the same goes for good conversation. So I'm going to be completely honest with you in the spirit of vulnerability. I get imposter syndrome every single time I sit behind this microphone to do this show. I've had the fortune to fish a lot in my life. So the things that I know about fly fishing are, they come from a place of rote repetition and the, the school of hard knocks. That, that's where, what I, what meager things I know about fly fishing, that's where I got them from. It, there's not some like found of, exo, found of esoteric wisdom or anything crazy like that, that I've just sprung up. And, uh, you know, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The best anglers in the industry came by their knowledge that same way. All right. Now they've got a lot of years on me. I mean, Tom Rosenbauer is older than me. Kelly Gallup's older than me. Uh, Shoot. Even Alex is older than me. He doesn't like me reminding him, but he is. So of course, people like Tom and Kelly and, certainly Alex, they're always going to know maybe more about fly fishing than I do. They're, they're going to have more insight just because they've been doing it longer, right? Their opportunity to learn is so much larger than mine by virtue of their age. All right. 
But what I've learned is that I have to try and discount the feeling that I don't have something to offer just because maybe I haven't been fly fishing as long or I don't have the same depth of knowledge as other anglers do, right? I, I went to school be, uh, to become a teacher, as a lot of our listeners know, and I'm an English teacher. And a part of teaching a subject like English is knowing how to break down a complex topic into chunks that a high schooler can understand. Uh, I mentioned earlier, but I'm just starting Romeo and Juliet with my freshman right now. And that's always an exercise of learning how to break things down, uh, feed it to them bit by bit so that eventually the beauty of Shakespeare's writing will hopefully click with some of them. It is beautiful. And the payoff's worth it when I see it click with a couple of the kids, because not every kid's going to love Shakespeare. And I get that. But when you, you see it click for a couple of them, it's, it's a lot of fun. But anyways, I'm, I'm not trying to make this about me, Chris, and I'm sorry, but I'm just trying to use that as an example to say that I don't necessarily think that feeling ever goes away because you never can master the sport of fly fishing. You ask any of the titans of this industry, you ask Kelly, you ask Tom, you ask Dom Swintoski, you ask any of these guys who are very accomplished anglers who know what they're doing. And they'll tell you, yeah, they haven't mastered it. They don't know everything there is to know about it. Nobody does. And that's kind of the beauty of it, right? Someone told me once that you need to be comfortable where you're at or confident, pardon me. You got to be confident with where you're at, but not comfortable because comfort breeds laziness. And if you want to get better, you can't be lazy. And I think that's a message we can all take to heart. Be confident in your skills now, Chris. And if you want to take that next step, which it sounds like you don't, and that's completely fine, right? Many anglers are just really happy to be at that self-sufficient stage and they don't necessarily need or want to get more out of fly fishing than that, that they're getting enough out of it. They don't need to level up, but if you do, then push yourself out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. You're catching fish now and that's important, but the most important thing, Chris, is that it sounds like you're happy with where you're at. And then, honestly, that's really the whole point of fly fishing. If it doesn't make you happy, why are you doing it? We do it at the end of the day, not because we want to catch fish, but because it makes us happy, because it's fun, right? And here, here at VFC, we've got a motto that we like to live by. It's live real life, and we spell it R-E-E-L like a fly reel because we're punny people here. But to me, when I say live real life, I'm saying go out there. Enjoy the moment that you're in. You're not an imposter. You're as successful as you want to be in this sport. And that's living real life, in my view. So thank you for coming to my TED Talk, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chris, for giving me uh, that opportunity to uh, dive into a side of fly fishing that we don't always talk about here on the show. I appreciate it so much. And I appreciate all of you who listen to this show every week. It consistently blows my mind how many folks listen to this show. It, it's it's hard to understand sometimes for me that people actually want to hear what we've got to say here at Untangled. So I appreciate it so much. And like I've said before, if you can rate and subscribe to the show, wherever you're listening, you subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the more visibility we get. Same with the ratings. It just helps spread the good word of VFC. So please make sure that you rate and subscribe to Untangled wherever you listen to it. And again, if you do have any questions that you would like answered on the show, please do not hesitate. Drop me a line. There's always a link in the podcast description to submit those questions. I love getting them. I love hearing from all y'all. And you know what? The weather's great. It's going to be even better. So turn this show off. Go out there. And until next week, tight lines, everybody. <laughs>